where I see the biggest unforced error for a SaaS company to say is when they fight this way. Now, may, maybe I'll be proven wrong, but this is so much money, so much energy. And I see so many of the smartest founders in SaaS saying AI is stupid. My competitors have these dumb hallucinations. It doesn't work. I don't need AI in my space. It doesn't make my product better. Maybe you're right in 2024. Maybe, maybe you are right. But you're going to lose that deal eight times out of 10 when your competitor that looks a lot like you goes in and gets everyone excited about efficiency for AI. Thank you for coming out. So I was thinking about the last couple of years when we got together in Barcelona. It was interesting time in June of 2022 because everyone was still growing like a weed, but that the little old stock market had fallen like 50% sync cloud stocks. So it was a weird time, 2022. And the message in 2022 was like, no excuses, keep going. Sure, okay, sorry you can't raise it 27x ARR, like Slack sold to Salesforce for 27 billion on a billion in revenue. Sorry that era didn't last forever. Like a lot of VCs were hoping it did, but everything was still pretty damn good in 2022. And then last year, the message was, guys, it's just harder. It's just like 2017, 2018 into 2019 was. Um, and then I'm thinking, what's the message for this year? And I want to talk about it because I think there's just a lot of things going on. Some folks are actually doing great, which we'll talk about in a minute. There's a lot of doom and gloom on the social medias, on the X's, on the Twitters. LinkedIn's so B2B that everyone's a Debbie Downer on LinkedIn. If that was the only way I got my information from LinkedIn, I think I would jump, jump into the Thames and call it a day. But it's actually much more nuanced. There are plenty of folks that are doing great. Even private companies, Netscope, which is a security that are just put out a press release yesterday. They're growing over 30% at 500 million in revenue. 500 million in revenue. There's plenty of them. We're going to talk about that. Canva just said they're growing over 40% at 2.3 billion in revenue at their user conference the other day. It isn't to say things are hard. They're just all over the place. And so the best advice I think I can give you, having been doing SaaS for longer than I want to admit, is just build. Just build. When things, literally when the world ended in 2008, 2009, it actually wasn't even that bad for SaaS. We could talk about it during this event. Just keep building. When things crashed in 2016, it was only six months, but in 2016, there was a panic. And I wasn't even following the public markets. It's embar I'm embarrassed to say. We got into 2016. The SaaS annual was in February 2016. And that week, SaaS stocks fell 50%. In one week, it was a crash. Everyone panicked. People said no one's going to buy software anymore. The panic lasted about six months. LinkedIn panicked and sold to Microsoft really cheap, 20, I think 25, 26 billion, but it was a profitable rocket ship with no need to sell. They were public, but everyone panicked. Everyone thought lasted about six months. Now, this one's different. This one, we're going into year three. So I'm going to talk about the different things going on, but if I had to summarize all of it, you cannot control everything. You cannot control public multiples. You cannot control a lot of stuff in the short term, but you can control whether you're more competitive or less competitive. You can't comp you can be more customer centric. You can keep building and things will ebb and flow over time. We've been doing this stuff says 15 years. I think it's a little longer. They will ebb and flow. And if you keep your head in the game and you increase your competitive position, even if things are hard for you, they'll come back. So that's my best simplistic advice for these days is just build. I put this tweet together. I thought this kind of summarizes what I wanted to chat about is three worlds that we're living in today. I don't know if B2B to C and B2B to B actually exist, but I'm going to use them going forward. B2B to C is folks selling to the real world, selling to the not, not to tech companies. They're doing pretty good. And we'll go through some examples. Canva was a great one, but there's plenty of others. The overall I'm not exactly sure how the London economy is doing, but the, the U.S. economy is close to record low unemployment, okay? It's not perfect over across the pond, but it's pretty darn good. There are, there's wobbles and we did just convict an ex-president. Not everything's normal or great, but pretty good in the real world, in the real world outside of tech. 2021 was the opposite. The real world was okay, but boy, people bought more software like 11 times an hour in 2021. Like tech was overloaded, but B2B seems pretty good. B2B2B, B2B, B2B, I thought it would have bounced back by now. I thought what would have happened is, look, we've been through a cycle where a lot of companies just cut vendors. Maybe too much because I, it's a trite VC saying, but it's true. You can't cut your way to growth. Cutting does not produce growth. And people, companies go through moments where they have moments of panic, which I don't think is really happening in a lot of companies because they sell to end consumers. 
or they just go through moments where there are zeitgeist, which is to rationalize vendors, to cut vendors. And big, public, successful companies not in tech are just cutting their stack from 200 apps or 300 apps to 150. Or I'll give some examples. And that makes sense. And people overbought. So when you overbought in 2020, late 2020, 21, it makes sense for people to say there's just way too many SaaS apps. Adam Gross was the interim CEO of Vimeo, public company at over 400 million. He came to our SaaS or Miami event. He said, one of the things when I started Vimeo a couple months ago was like, we had 100 SaaS apps. I didn't even know why we had them. So even though he's a SaaS guy since inception, I'm going to cut, I'm here as CEO. He just brought in the full-time CEO. I'm going to cut like 50 of these because no one can even explain to me why we bought these. So it makes sense we did that, but I thought we would bounce off that process. We would get through it. We would stop cutting and we would get back to growth. I thought that, and I think a lot of folks in impacted categories, I remember I did an interview, you can see it on YouTube, maybe six months ago with Henry Shook, one of the great founders, CEO of Zoom Info. And his point was, listen, we've got, we've bounced off the bottom, so we've got to go up from here. But we haven't seen that yet. It hasn't gotten better yet in a lot of B2B2B. I think it will. But um, I can't predict. I can't predict. I don't think any of us can predict well is why we have to build. And then there's this thing called AI. And I just wrote WTF because there's a lot of things going on in AI. It's terrific that we have 200x ARR rounds back. It's great. We'll talk a little bit about that and we'll talk more about it tomorrow. But it's warping a lot of things we think. And in some ways, 2021, uh, the headlines, the funding rounds and everything feels 2021 done all over again, just different for, for only for a subset, on, only for a subset. This is my slice of the world. It's not monolithic. And I put this together. I put a few leaders here on the left and then tweet and did others. Here's some folks that are not selling to other tech companies that are doing pretty well. Canva, 40% of 2.3 billion. It's pretty darn good. Profitable for years. Toast selling to restaurants, growing 32% at 1.3 billion ARR. I invested in a company that's adjacent to Toast called Owner, which is like marketing for restaurants. They're, they've crossed 20 million. They're growing almost 10% a month every month. It's a good company, but the point of the story is they haven't seen any macro impacts because their end customers are, aren't seeing it. There's some. Um, Sara, great CEO and great team. We've had a lot of the team. The chief product officer did a great session at Sastra Annual on how they do five products, which is a great one to watch on YouTube. 39% at 1.1 billionaire, and that's the one in the middle or one at the, look at the top. They're aggressively hiring. They're selling to F truckers and fleets and consumers that are doing reasonably well. 39% of 1.1 billion. Clavio, who will be here and talk about how they're going. If you haven't heard of Clavio, if you're in the e-commerce world, it is the most beloved app. People love Clavio. It's coming up on a billion in revenue. The number one app in the Shopify ecosystem. Growth has come down a little bit, but 42% of 750 million and 30 some odd percent coming up on a billion. Those are end consumers. Monday is always interesting. A lot of folks probably don't use Monday because Monday, Monday does a lot, has a lot of products, but we can think of it as an Asana or a Linear or an Atlassian for non-tech customers. They started off, we did a great session with the co-CEO Ron at SAS Ranian last year. They started selling to churches and folks like that. And I don't think churches are having a down year. I don't think they're having an up year. Maybe they are having a down year. Maybe donations are down, but it's like the not the same variability that our friends at Zoom and Zoom Info and others have. So they're on the way to a billion in revenue, they're growing 34%. And then the whole world of security, if you're not in it, you don't get, in fact, I'm not a security expert, but it's evergreen. The threats keep going and CAOs have to keep putting budget. Zscaler said they're growing 32% at 2.2 billion and it's smaller competitors. We talked about private Netscope over 30% at 500 million. CrowdStrike and others, there, there are others. Wiz is, seems to be the fastest growing software startup ever in today's markets. These are areas, I call them vertical SaaS is less impacted, B2B to C security. It's pretty good here. If you're not in a pretty good space, you may be, you may, it may feel really hard, but realize it's not everybody like it looks like on social media. Now, B2B had a rough week. And when I was starting to put this, to get, think about this deck a couple of weeks ago, I didn't know what we'd have a week like this. This was a blood, if, if you don't follow the public markets, and hopefully you don't as founders, I, I would encourage you to put your money into BTI, the broad stock market, and just invest in your own stock. And don't worry too much because it'll come up and down. But this last week was nuts So Mongo down 23%. Mongo, one of the great, one of the great cloud stocks, had consistently grown in the 30s or higher. Great CEO, great team. Everyone uses it. There's competitors, but everyone uses Mongo. Then just last week, they said, we're only going to grow 17% next year. Huge drop. UiPath, 
Huge drop, 30%. Lots of issues with UiPath, which we love. Daniel Darn spoke here last year. Excellent session. Just came back as CEO the other week. Growth is still good, but UiPath had no net new customers last quarter. No net new customers. Now, they did grow because they, they grew a lot of their accounts, which is a way a lot of us are still growing at scale if we're not adding new logos. Their 5 million and up customers are at a record size at UiPath. Their 1 million is growing, but no the net new customers. Think how different that is than Canva or Toast. Think how different it is. And then Salesforce, if you didn't follow it, good. Like you got other stuff, just go build. But Salesforce lost $50 billion in market cap. $50 billion. And what happened, they missed the quarter by a little bit. Who cares? What Mark said, what the team said is, we're only going to grow in the single digits next year. Only grow in the single digits. And why is that? bad. And I thought about it a little bit. One, obviously single digits is not great. It's not a growth stock. It's at the edge, but the real problem. And I don't think Wall Street thinks about this. Wall Street just reacted that the growth was in single digits. Salesforce has never grown slowly in its whole history. But if you think about it, Salesforce has gotten pretty enterprise. They have 115, 120% NRR. You're supposed to grow at least 15 to 20% if you have 15, 120% NRR. And so it's a sign that something's at least for the moment broken in the system. And, and what they talked about at Salesforce, what's happening? The deals that they projected are closing. They're longer sales cycles, blah, blah, blah. It's harder out there, which we'll talk about. But also the deals are just smaller than they projected. Deals are contracting. And a lot of folks in tech blame deal contraction because of layoffs. It's not true. It's not true. There are far more hiring going on in tech even today than layoffs. So anyone that says, oh, we're contracting because... All our customers are doing layoffs. It's an excuse. Even Salesforce says it's an excuse. It's not true. They're still hiring. It's just folks are managing their budgets so tightly. They're saying, we just, we'll take less seats to Salesforce this year. Maybe our SMB team can just use Google Sheets or I don't know what's going on. I don't know how you can contract, but they're contracting their spend. They're contracting their spend. And so we're going to see some brutal NRRs, some brutal revenue retention, because what I think this overblown budget scrutiny, but brutal week, but it ain't going to be like this every week, but it's a big one. But that contrast to the canvas and the others, it's super visceral. It's super visceral. This is a slide. If I wanted to buck folks up, if you're in a tougher category, this is a slide that I saw the other day. I invested, I was the first investor in a company called Revenue Cat, which automates mobile subscriptions on your phone. So about 30% of all mobile apps that have a paid subscription use Revenue Cat to manage it. And why that's interesting is that they have over 10,000 what they call B2B2C apps, consumer, though they call it consumer SaaS, I call it B2C, over 10,000. So it's a pretty good slice, 30% of this mobile ecosystem. And what they saw, and, cause, cause, and why this is interesting is because consumer happens faster than B2B. B2B takes time, right? Even Salesforce, it's multi-year contracts. Everyone says how great ServiceNow is holding up, which it is. ServiceNow, 15x ARR, 99% uh, logo retention. They also signed three-year contracts at ServiceNow. Even if things were tough at ServiceNow, it's, bit, it's going to take a while to see it. And then it would take a while to rebound. In consumer, you can cancel in 60 seconds on your phone. So what did they see if you look? 2021 was great. And then 2022 sucked. 20, look how far There was no growth. And then 2023 has been a rocket ship, right? And I can tell you as an investor, the revenues track that too. No, no downturn. No downturn in this mobile economy. One of the early things I wrote on Saster, and I think it's still true, is that B2B lags B2C by about two years. It lags it by about two years. If 2023 was when everything rebounded on these fast cycles, maybe the simplistic way to look at it is 2025 has got to be when, buy, when it gets easier for a lot of folks in classic B2B. That's the belief. And I think this data at least suggests it. So that's my little sketch there. So I think we can believe that. But to be clear, and sorry to go a little bit, here's a few other quotes, just so you know it's not you. Here's Yamini Rangan, CEO of HubSpot this last quarter. Both actually HubSpot and Salesforce saw a bump at the end of the fiscal year in January 31st, but it didn't last, right? Even though HubSpot grew 23% of 2.5 billion, weaker demand, longer sales cycles, they're now having, they're now having to do pilots at HubSpot, which they didn't have, used to have to do. They're having to sell to CIOs and multiple stakeholders. So... They've done well, but it's not easier for them. And actually, HubSpot's NRR has fallen to 100%. So to grow 23%, they had to add 23% net new customers. I might be slightly off on the number, but it's, it's exa almost exactly that. So in 2021, they had 110% NRR. It was like a record. You can watch the great session I did. I guess we did in 2022 after that, but we did it with Darmesh and Brian, the co-founders. They were at 110, but the drop from 100 to 110 to 100 is a lot of extra work. So they haven't seen it gotten any easier. 
Um, here's Zoom Info. We talked about Henry. As it relates to NRR, our SMB business is challenged. Zoom Info's tech NRR is about 85% now. About 85%, down from triple digits to 85%. Their non-tech customers, are, I believe, are still growing north of 20%, but these the tech ones are just, they're all getting around the room or the Zoom and saying, how can we buy less Zoom Info? Can, can Mark and Jason share a seat? Will Henry find out? What can we do? It's not that they're canceling Zoom Info, but they're so aggressively cutting the spend that, that it's hitting them. And, and then here we saw Mongo, actually, they lowered it even more, down to 12% growth, they're modeling from 57%. And this is consumption. We thought that your database, there's only so much you could do to manage the, the spend if you're growing. But again, Mongo isn't seeing more logo churn there. Everyone's saying, how can we optimize workloads? How can we use Mongo just less to save money? And we talked about Salesforce. I can't believe this will last. I can't believe large companies can spend their entire lifetimes trying to manage their workloads down on Mongo. We have to grow. But there is no, I would have thought all of these folks would be seeing a bounce back. Instead, I think, the length of contracts and other things that actually mean we're finally seeing things tougher that actually started maybe 18 months ago, but they're only appearing in the public market data today. And this one was this one was interesting to see to be helpful. Not that it's like good news, but if you look at the analyst call, everyone was really on message, but Mark Benioff just went off. He spent about 30 minutes talking about how Salesforce is an AI company now, which it probably is, but it's not like it lifted their revenue and he went on and on. And then he was actually very candid about their pipeline, which I thought was very interesting. He said two years ago, 18 months ago, they needed 2x pipeline coverage. So for every dollar they wanted to close, they needed 2x in their pipe. It can vary for you. A lot of startups, actually, you're lucky if you have 5x, like if 20% of your pipeline converts. If it's 25%, that's pretty best of breed. But to some extent, it matters how you define pipeline, what you put in it, et cetera, et cetera. Salesforce has a good brand, and I think they're pretty specific about what they manage. But it was 2x. Now it's 3x. It's 3x. Forget about the, all the other issues, the sales cycles and the deal compressions. They need to have 50% more pipe to hit the same number. If Salesforce does, you probably do too. But it's a way to understand for classic b 2 b what it's like out there went on and on about how they need 3X. Um, and it's harder on the sales team, harder on everyone, but it was, uh, it was great to get that level of, of kind of transparency across this. And here's where AI confuses everything. Gartner, the other day, May 20th, so this is less than two weeks ago, raised their estimate for the amount of SaaS spend this year, raised it, raised it. If you want, if you've been around for a while, you can make fun of Gartner a little bit, but you know what? Gartner's the only one out there that is surveying hundreds and hundreds of CIOs and buyers every quarter. No one else is really doing this. G2 and others that are great do a little bit of it, but Gartner has been doing it, I think, for over 130 years. They've been surveying CEOs, CIOs every quarter. And the changes and the pulse is pretty helpful. And it was super interesting. It's a little hard to see in, the, in this chart, but and I'm also colorblind, so I don't know what colors these are. But what you can see is the one on the right is them lifting the model for SaaS. That it's going to grow 20% to $675 billion this year. So we're adding $120 billion in spend in SaaS. And that's not infrastructure as they define it. There's some overlap. It's a little, it's a little niche, which we talk about on the right. But pure SaaS spending 20%, oh, sorry, to $247.2 billion on the right. So what's happening here, right? It's pretty confusing. If we're adding 20%, where is this money going? And to some extent, it's not clear. Some of it's certainly endless price hikes, endless price increases. All, people are still raising prices everywhere. Even yesterday, Spotify raised prices again for, the, for, I think, the third time in three years. So that's consuming some of it. But a lot of it is moving to versions of AI. And here, I copy these from Jam and Ball. You don't have to follow these details. But this is growth on the platform side. This is Azure and Google Cloud and AWS. But look at how much acceleration the spend has been on Azure and Google Cloud. This is all AI. This is all AI. So they bottomed out a year ago or a year and a half ago, but this AI spend this amount of money is fueling this here, right? Obviously, we've heard of this little company, NVIDIA, that's been around for a long time, that's had a good run, up $40 billion in one day. Um, I guess it balances out Salesforce. But there's so much money going here into this. The question is, how, as a startup, how do you benefit from it? Um, Salesforce itself isn't benefiting from it, even though it's building the applications. Dell actually got hit. Dell fell 15% last week. Dell said the, the good, we're seeing demand pick up, but also it's more expensive to provide servers for AI. So it's a wash for us. So it's a little murky who exactly is benefiting it. But one thing we know, 
AI, VCs are all over it. So there's one thing that's crystal clear. And I think, I, I, I think there's a session that we'll be doing on this tomorrow. I'm a little murky. I'll let you know later today. But I really call it the hunt for riches. And this needs its own session to dig into it. But if nothing else is happening, especially folks for fundraising, this is where VCs are deploying. It's one of the three places VCs are deploying money. They're deploying money into seed. Everything's great. We can chat about it for a minute. They're deploying money into their existing portfolio. They're their winners. Even though maybe only 10 or 20% of their companies may be breaking out, they're flooding them with capital. And they're doing what appears to some of us old timers as crazy deals for AI, 100x, 200x deals. And why? Why could Elon Musk for XAI raise at 18 billion with no revenue and a brand new product? That seems high. It's high for a seed round, isn't it? I think. I don't know. Anyone from Crunchbase or Carter here that got the data on, on seed rounds? Great things like Scale.io, but a billion dollars. Excel putting an extra, already the lead investor, putting an extra billion dollars. Philippe will be here. He can tell us all about it. And why? What's going on here? Obviously, you can see the dollars at this term hyperscalers, but at the cloud leaders, at Google Cloud and Azure especially, justify it. But if OpenAI is really doing $2 billion in essence in 18 months, like that's the bet people want to make. This is how you make money in venture is you try to get some, the one that's going to $2 billion in 18 or 24 months when there's a paradigm shift and you might lose on all the others. These are great. Do companies that seem epic like Poolside that are brand new and have essentially no revenue, are they worth $1.5 billion in 12 months? Maybe if you've got the ex-CTO of, of GitHub there, maybe, but it's a bet. It's like a super speculative bet. But what's happened, the one thing, why does 2024 in AI feel like 2021 a little bit with all the unicorns? One thing to just, if I had to summarize all of what's happening in VC is everyone became a decacorn hunter in 2021. People used to be unicorn hunters. Christoph's first investment was in Zendesk. What were they worth? 800 million when they IPO'd, something like that? Yeah, 800. Now it's got to be 8 billion to get out of bed, right? It's just not enough. The funds got bigger. Val seed rounds, what was the valuation at Zendesk in the seed round? 2 million? A bit less? A million something? If now the, the Zendesk would be 20 million, what's that? Series A was three. Okay. Three million. Yeah. So great. You raise, so if it's three million then, and if it's 30 million for the A today or 50 million and everything's gone up 10x, the exits have to go up 10x too, right? And funds are structured for this. Funds are looking for $10 billion exits. And it actually puts a lot of pressure on folks that are doing pretty good. That you just, if you, if a v, the only way a VC can make money is not just if you exit for a billion, which is pretty hard, pretty hard to exit for a billion, but it has to be 10 billion. Almost any VC is going to be looking at you and say, can you be worth 10 billion? billion dollars. So think about that lens. And right now in SaaS, the problem, let me see if I have this on the slide. Uh, I might have it for a longer one I did. So sorry, I'll flip back. We may get into this tomorrow. How many, there are SaaS companies worth more than 10 billion for sure. HubSpot's worth 30 billion, Atlassian 40 billion, maybe 30. They had a drop. There's plenty of them. Snowflake, Datadog. So you can believe they're there in SaaS and, and related, but there's tons of really good ones that aren't worth 10 billion, right? HashiCorp was the last IPO of the 2020 wave, IBM just bought them for $6 billion, which is insane, but it might not be enough for a big fund to make any money, right? We've had two, I think I have a slide on here, but we've had two SaaS IPOs since 2021. Glavio that's here, one of my all-time favorite companies and CEOs, $6 billion market cap on $800 million in revenue. Rubrik, one of the best founders, $6 billion market cap on $500 something million in revenue. Rubik was growing 50% at IPO, Clavio 70%. Those companies aren't even worth 10 billion. And these sound like silly numbers as a founder, but you have to understand like that a lot of VCs might look are looking at those deals, the the Clavio and Rubrics and saying, it's not enough for my $2 billion fund. That's not enough for your series B round at 100 you want 150 for your series B great, but if I want to make 20 or need to make 20 or 30 or 40 excellent investment to work, like I need and Clavio and Rubrik aren't, are you really, are you sure you're better than Clavio and Rubrik? It's producing stress. If the Clavios and Rubrics, which I think should be 15X ARR or better companies, I think they should be worth north of 10 billion. If they're not, where do you hunt? Where do you hunt as a VC? You hunt an AI. 
even though you might lose all your money, even though people are going to lose so much money on these deals, you in, in the way funds are structured now, they're permanently, at least U.S. style funds. I know there's smaller ones in Europe, but U.S. style funds are permanently focused on $10 billion outcomes. Even, I would argue, Roger Ehrenberg, who founded one of the great early seed funds, IA Ventures, they did so many. They did almost 20% of the trade desk, which is worth $35 billion, Datadog and others. He just did this tweet response yesterday is any seed fund north of $60 billion has to find $10 billion exits, even a seed fund. And we can walk through some of that math tomorrow, but that's why you see these crazy, you're, you're scratching your head like, why are Sequoia and these guys are pretty smart at Andreessen's. Why are they doing these deals? They're no, no one's a dummy in venture. If you think someone's a dummy, they're not dummies, but they are making bets. And it's a hunt for riches in AI. The, the thing I would say to SaaS folks and I pulled up this company, C3 AI. If you haven't followed it, it's Tom Siebel's old company who founded the original CRM that Salesforce displays called Siebel. He went really early in AI. And no one actually knows what this company does, but at least it's been AI since inception. It's down 45% this year. So being AI does not necessarily lead to riches. Salesforce being highly AI enabled doesn't do it. Dell doesn't do it. So my main point here to founders is there's two things about AI. One, you've got to have AI parity with the competition, which is worth chatting for a minute. You've got to, or you're going to lose deals. But changing your TLD or your URL or adding the slide, you may trick an investor or two. Don't give, give it a shot, but it's not enough. It's not enough to say you're an AI company today for a million reasons. It's not enough because everyone that needs to be an AI company should be becoming one. Everyone should be using APIs. Everyone should be enhancing their product. But there, there, there is, there is, there's a hunt for riches, but people aren't stupid. It's got to be real. Whatever real AI is, it's got to be real AI. And, and if Mark Benioff can't convince Wall Street he's an AI company now with all their investment, you, you likely are not going to be able to, to, to if it's not yourself. Okay, maybe just a couple other things I want to hit. And if we have any time left, we could take some questions. This is a meta question that people are talking about what should be talking about even more. This is the mystery. This goes back to the Gartner growth of 20%. It goes back, where is this budget coming from AI? And people talk about there being experimentation budgets. I met when I was in London with a wildly smart and successful VC asking me how big CIO's AI budgets are. And every CIO I've asked for has no AI budget. There's no, no CEO went to their CIO and said, hey, here's a couple extra billion for AI. It's just not the way the enterprise works. But it's there, it's being repurposed. It's being repurposed. There is a company I invested in the post-sales space that they have a, one of their 10 largest customers is struggling, struggling a bit, but public company. They went in and cut 30% of their post-sales apps and bought one for a million dollars a year as their AI bet. But where'd the money come from? Cutting, cut, they cut core apps. They cut 30 apps and brought in one to free up the budget, right? And this was a little question from RBC Capital and Bloomberg. I would question this money on AI is coming at the expense of expansion at Salesforce. It may be. It may be cutting back the extra products they'd buy at Salesforce for AI. And Dell said the same thing. And here, Viva, Peter Gastner, one of the great SaaS CEOs, Viva is a vertical SaaS company, only raised about $3 million and is worth $35 billion today. Um, very specific. The biggest pharma and biotech companies run their businesses on Viva. He actually used to be the VP of engineering or CTO at Salesforce. Even he's saying it's a competing priority. Like they're putting off buying more and spending more with Viva to do, to manage their drug discovery and manage their processes for AI. So this, the month, the budgets are being mixed up and returned and two, just two things on it. This is what's happening. There is no magical AI line budget at big companies. There is no magical thing. Stuff is being cut to fund these initiatives and why? A little bit of it is fear that you've got to be doing this, right? The companies have fear, CIOs have some fear, but some of it is huge efficiency promises. So I'll give you a quick example. Uh, I'm on the board of a company called Gorgeous, which is the largest contact center in e-commerce. And they've got about 16,000 Shopify customers coming up on a hundred million in revenue. And they're very SMB, like their average deal size is 5K now. It used to be 3K. It's actually 5K because of AI. Chat about that. But they just closed their first 750K TCV deal, 250K a year for three years, 750K. That's a lot going up market. And where'd this money come from, right? Turns out because of their AI, they're going to lay off 400 folks in support. 400 folks. So let's, 250K sounds like a lot of money, but it's a big company. It's 20K a month. 
If you lay off foreigner folks and support and replace them with AI, can you free up 20K a month? Yeah. The, the human impacts here are a little bit brutal. I remember in the early days of e-signatures, which was about efficiency, we went out to Comcast, one of our biggest customers, and they took us to a floor, which was huge. It was dark. They flipped on the lights and there were all these empty file cabinets that were replaced with Echo Sign, Adobe Sign. And there are 80 people they didn't need. It wasn't 200. There are 80 people they didn't need filing their contracts for broadband internet anymore. The money doesn't come out of nowhere. So there are some real human impacts to AI, right? Positive in that, I personally, I need a lot of AI people because I can't get anybody to do a lot of work. I can't get anybody to like do, do our podcast or our YouTubes. Like I need help uh, myself. But vendors are promising huge efficiency gains. Are they working? There's our, we're already seeing yo-yos. We're already seeing in the enterprise a lot of frustrated customers who are over-promised by vendors that are coming back and saying their initial 1.0 deployments did not work, expensive. We're seeing that all across the, the space. So I don't, I think everything, we all know everything's getting better. Let's not read too much into that, but it's here. The related point that if I wanted to give some advice, I want to be crystal clear. And you can be a little bit, a lot of us in core B2B can be a little cynical of AI, right? Is it really... Some, for some of our apps, it won't make things any better, right? I, for some things, it's minor. But what is clear to me is if your competitors are out there promoting efficiency gains from AI and you are not, and you do not have feature parity, you're going to lose this deal. You are going to lose this deal. People want, and, they, and I, I know they, the, the, the initial promises in 2024 aren't being met. It's frustrating customers. But they know this is a bet they have to make. And they do believe it's going to get better, or at least they hope it's going to get better in 2025 and 2026. They see it. And I, where I see the biggest unforced error for SaaS companies to say is when they fight this wave. They fight this wave. Now, may, maybe I'll be proven wrong, but this is so much money, so much energy. And I see so many of the smartest founders in SaaS saying AI is stupid. Uh, everything, my competitors have these dumb hallucinations. It doesn't work. I don't need AI in my space. It doesn't make my product better. Maybe you're right in 2024. M maybe, maybe you are right. I use Canva every day. I don't really use their AI stuff. I don't, I don't know if it's any good. I use Loom all the time. I don't know if it's really makes my Loom experience any better. I don't know. But you're going to lose that deal eight times out of 10 when your competitor that looks a lot like you goes in and gets everyone excited about efficiency for AI. So don't do it. Do what you will, just build, but don't fight this. If, you, if you're not AI first, don't be AI first. But I know I'm being uh, a little redundant, but this is so important. Look at your top five competitors. Do a sheet. Be honest with yourself, your product, and your co-founders. What are they doing in AI today? And what are they promising in the next 12 months? If it, even if it's a check-the-box feature, you better darn check it. It's like going into a deal in the enterprise when you're not SOC 2 compliant and they are, or versions of that, if you've been in there, you're just going to lose the deal. They're just going to say, I just don't trust you. I just need it. I don't care if you're better or more innovative. I need the SOC too. So I think everyone in the world should do that for no other reason. It's AI has become, you're just going to lose to the competition. This one we hit, but it's helpful to see it here. There's a few things that are just making everything also harder, which is that the public markets suck. They just suck uh, on a bunch of levels. Uh, multiples are low, but also we've only had two real IPOs. and you look, if they were junky IPOs or struggling companies, would be one thing, but only ones that bothered to IPO since HashiCorp in 2020 were really good. Clavio and Rubrik, two, two. Everyone else is waiting. Stripe is waiting. Plaid is waiting. Canva certainly could have IPO'd earlier, two and a half billion in revenue, growing 40%. They're waiting. People are waiting. But the ones that did have $6 billion market caps on their way to a billion in revenue with top tier growth, top tier NRR, top tier everything, this is just a drag on everything. It's a drag on every type of fundraising from Series A later. And it's just a drag. It's not going to last. This is a, I think Tomas Tungus just put out a good summary of the data yesterday. You can see it on LinkedIn or his blog. I think SaaS IPOs are at a, a 10 or 15 or 20 year low or long low or tech IPOs. So it's not going to last, but it is tough out there. There is very little liquidity in the system. And it's just, it, it is creating subtle stresses. Like the bar is just really high. If you really have to get to 600 million growing 50% to IPO, I know most of you are close, but it's, a, it's the most intimidating bar in my career. So it's just, it is, it, it is what it is. Maybe I blotted this one over, but the multiples are still men. I didn't, I've been talking about multiples much more the last three or four years at these events in Saster, but Here's my simple way of thinking about it. You should, this is the BVP cloud index. You can track it on Bessemer sites or other places. The median public SaaS company 
is trading at 6x ARR, the median. Now, some are struggling, some are higher. The, the, so a lot of the best ones, the Samsara's and others are trading at 15. But this creates, this makes it really hard for, peop, for VCs to make money. It makes it hard for a lot of things to happen in the system. And if I had to summarize all of this, a lot of old timers will say, hey, this is just how it was in 2016 or 2015 or 2014 or 2017. Maybe this will, there's different ways to slice the data, but I think it won't get easier for us until this is about 8x, until we see 20 to 30% reflation in multiples. And it may sound like just a number, but it's not. It makes everything so much easier. These valuations work, the capital raising works, the investment works. 6x is just, you're here. So I'm, the, the average folks that attends a SASR event, I think is around 5 million ARR, right? Works so hard. It took you seven years. You're worth 30 million. It's not that great. It's a bummer. You want to be, the good news is you're going to keep building and growing and you're going to go from five and we'll see you at 10 the next year and then 20 and 40. But it's tough for the world that we got, certainly got used to the last four years to operate well at 6X. Um, and uh, so that's the one to look at. When this reflates a little bit, and then is it really all interest rates? I'm no longer sure. Is it really all this? We're no longer sure. But 6X, it's, it's still a tough world. And maybe just two things to summarize. And again, we, I think as a community, we over talk about BC, but it, it is important at many levels if you're fundraising or just to understand the pulse of the system. Every VC that I know wants to invest. There's new VCs that have only been in a couple of years. They've got capital. They don't care about the past. There's folks like Christoph and others here who've got many winners, so they still want to invest. I don't know any VC that doesn't have winners that doesn't want to invest today. So if folks are saying VCs don't want to invest, that's wrong. The, the folks that have only lost or got fired last week, they don't really want to invest. But everyone that's been around is looking, they're always hunting for winners. But there is real stress in the system. I picked three recent examples. The one on the left shows rolling IRRs, rates of returns for VCs. And it, the way VCs calculate return is different than, than others. But what you can see is like in 2021, like VC returns went crazy, right? What is this, 80%? And this is why everyone raised like three funds that year. It was not, actually the real problem is that even LPs, the folks that give VC money, thought this was sustainable. 80% returns are not, what is it? Who, who can tell me what 80% compounded over 20 years is? It's like a lot, isn't it? It's like infinity or something like that. I don't know what it is, but it's crashed, right? And so I, real IRRs, everyone is full of shit in venture on Twitter. Oh, I'm, all my investments are so great. I'm such a genius. I own 0.0001% of this unicorn. I made so much money. But the real IRRs, when you blend it all together, they're negative. So this is just stress. And VCs are getting a little bit of a pass from their own investors, limited partners who are saying, look, we're going to give you a mulligan in some cases on one fund, but it's just stress. It is stress. It is stress a little bit on early stage funds, but it's huge stress on growth funds, which did lots of unicorns, hundreds of unicorns. And it's going to take them a decade to figure out what to do with fallen unicorns. They, they, it, it's a decade. And here's, just two other examples. On the right, what we're seeing stress is Squarespace. I don't know if you guys use, we use Squarespace at Sastra for a lot of our sites. We use all these products. They're going private in a $7 billion transaction. Sounds great, $7 billion, but I think they're at $1.3, $1.4 billion, growing 20-something percent a month. It's a, and that's a premium to where they were trading. They were trading at like 4X, maybe even less net of cash. So why go, like everyone, we're talking about going IPO to get liquidity, to do M&A, to why, why go private? It is a sign of stress in the system. It's a sign that the public markets are not working for Squarespace for a variety of reasons. There's a whole bunch of things. There's the low multiples we talked about. There's also such insane pressure on public companies to be very profitable today. It's too much. Salesforce is pushing toward 40% margins. Everyone needs to be above 30. It sounds great. It makes Wall Street happy. But where are you going to invest if you can't hire anybody? So I actually believe a lot of public SaaS companies are in a quiet decay state because they're not hiring anybody new. They're, there's too much efficiency. And so what do you do? One option is to go private. Give me three or four years to just invest. Instead of having to do 30%, 30 cents of out of every dollar, go to profits, I'll drop that to 10 cents or zero, grow faster, and then go public at 2 billion or 3 billion. That's the decision they're making, especially because the founder of Squarespace has been there since day one. And actually, he had an insane incentive package when they went IPO. It was almost like Elon Musk, if you read it. There's a Sasker post on it. If you look at the first one, he had these tiered grants. Elon had it. And I think if he grew it to 20 or 30 billion, he like doubled or tripled his equity stake. So to, to give that up and go private, it's a big give up that, that there's stress in the system. And then this one, 
Boy, this one's a tough one. A whole bunch of cloud leaders also before Squarespace have gone private. Uh, Avalara, Pluralsight, Zendesk went public for $10 billion. I don't know all the details of all the deals, but a lot of them were fueled with cheap debt that now has to be refinanced at much higher prices. If you, if you bought a company for three or four billion as a private equity firm, but you really only put in 20%, so maybe you put in 800 million or a billion, you borrowed three or four billion at 2%, and now you have to refinance it at eight. The problem is a lot of these SaaS companies don't generate enough. They're, they're, they're profitable, but they don't generate enough necessarily to service the debt. So this one was a shocker, even though it didn't get a ton of news. This, is this a canary in the coal mine? Or I don't know. Vista, which is one of the two or three biggest folks that buy SaaS companies, Vista, Tom O'Bravo, a few others, they bought Pluralsight. They're writing the entire $3.5 billion investment to zero. Entire investment. I don't know what Pluralsight's doing today, but we wrote them up on SaaS. I, I think when they were last doing public, they were doing $250 million or so. And they claim they had 27% profit margin. So they're generating 40, 50 million, 60 million of cash a year. But it, whatever happened here, it wasn't enough. So they're walking away from $3.5 billion investment. And I don't know how big this fund is, but I know it's sub 20. That's a lot to lose. If a lot of these deals don't work out, I was chatting earlier this week in London with someone that works at a Vista competitor or similar. And he was just saying, it's just so stressful. It's so stressful there because they don't, they bought all these companies that are good, but between the cost of servicing the debt and the revenue slowing down, this is stressful for a bunch of reasons. These firms are not engineered to lose, to have multiple losses like this. Seed funds can lose 40% of their, 60, even half of a seed fund's deals can make no money. It doesn't usually end up being half the money because your winners concentrate your money, but a seed fund you can write off half your investments. The PE guys can't write off half their investments. There's just, there's no returns. And and this is stressful in general, but, and I'll wrap up on this point if we're done with time. This is one of the, this has been one of the great liquidity outcomes, options. You don't have to always IPO and you don't have to worry if Adobe can't acquire Figma or other issues. You don't have to worry if Google won't buy you. If P was there and P, all of my billion dollar exits as an investor have come to P firms, a lot of them from Vista. Thank you. Another one of my early investments got acquired for 300 million a few weeks ago by a PE firm. They worked for years. The growth, great company at 30 million growth was good, but not great, but got bought for 300 million, 10X by PE firms. If this stops working and it started working around 2012, 20, it's just more stress. There's fewer exits. It's tougher on us. Everyone wants to deploy money. This to just raise another 20 billion, like it's there, but just understand that there's stress across the system. And sorry, I went a little long. So I'm just going to summarize these last ones. This one is a just, it's just direct. I just put this up on Sasser this week, but Emergence put together a bunch of data. Emergence, they were my investor and they invested in a ton of the early SaaS leaders from Viva to Bill to Yammer and others. They actually went to, I think, 20 or 30 seed VCs and got data from over 600 SaaS startups that were venture backed. So this is not normal. These are folks that about 20 really good VCs initialized, Cowboys and others, uh, all gave all of their data anonymized. So these are good ones. And they redid the data for me. And the question is like, how many of them are fundable? This is just one last takeaway here. It's tough. And so I asked them to redo it by top decile. And so there's a lot of data here and you can look at the slides later and we, we may be over, but if you squint a little bit, this is the top, this is the top 10% of this top 10% of all venture backed startups by top tier seed funds, top 10% venture backed by top. How are they growing in today's macro market? Less than 1 million, 120, 30% a year. So try to do 120, 30% a year. But to be more specific for later rounds, from the one to five, 166%, five to 20, the best ones are still doubling. And then after 20, only 42%. So this is top decile. So if we go back and, and we, we will talk, if we, have, if we have this session tomorrow, we'll talk more about it. VCs still need triple, triple, double to make money. They need you to triple and triple after 1 million in revenue and double. It's okay if there's bumps, but that's what it needs to be to, to IPO in less than a decade. And so roughly you got to be doing 166 or 200% in this first group, 100% in five to 20, and probably closer to 60% in the growth stage to be fundable. So looking at this, I would say maybe 10 to 15%, because this is a top decile. This is just enough to raise money. This is just enough to meet the venture bar. Be wary. Because if you have raised it, seed round is almost as easy to raise as ever today. I'm not saying it's easy, but there's so many seed investors and so many folks want to do it. Realize your next round is almost certainly going to be much harder than you thought. 
if the only the top decile of the top seed funded ones are at triple double double, the bar is really high, and all these. And so, just assume the next round isn't coming. And if you don't know, ask your investors honestly. Don't make push put them on the spot. Ask them, am I fundable? Because this is probably the toughest level in my career. Top 10, 10 to fifteen percent that already have venture backed are in a position today to raise another round. Now, I will say, not I don't want to be too gloom. Almost every founder I know has gone through periods when they were unfundable. I had is my five years, my last company before was acquired by Adobe. I think three of the years we weren't fundable. I raised the years we were fundable. And then I went profitable because I didn't want to deal with the stress. I don't most startups are not fundable every year for a lot of reasons. But be very cognizant if you are. Don't waste energy. Don't waste drama. Don't overspend your cash. If you're simply not in this top decile, better because it's almost certainly not going to happen. It doesn't matter how likable you are. It doesn't matter how pretty your deck is. It doesn't matter how many people you meet for coffee. This is the bar and it's harder to meet now than it has been. That's sort of, let me summarize, just build. B2B to C did come back fast. That's why I'm not like a good better, but I'm cautiously optimistic on 2025. I'm cautiously optimistic that if B2B to C came back two years ago, 2025, people are going to stop cutting everything and spend more. Um, IPO and liquidity sucks. Vistalop losing three and a half billion on Pluralsight sucks. Two IPO, you have to be over 50% growth at 500 million to IPO sucks, but some really good ones coming. Canvas, Stripe, Figma, others. I think people are going to get excited. People are going to get greedy again, which we need. The final just pointed, but there's stuff, multiples are meh. The fundraising is hard. A lot of this stuff you cannot control. Keep building. It takes 10 years to get anywhere good in SaaS. Seven to 10 years. Keep building. Be cognizant of the competition. Be better to the competition. And you get multiple chances at this. The pendulum swings back and forth. You can have it, but everyone has a year of hell. It will come back. And for the most, for many of us, we just have to push through some macro challenges we can't do anything about. So thanks, everybody. Thank you.